tropical storms and the Olympic Games. We're watching closely Tropical Storm Mirina. Current timing suggests that it will pass very close to Tokyo on Sunday. A summer of extremes. Our climate is changing and personally I find these data when I look at them quite alarming. And what nature can tell us about our changing climate. We've had an advance of something like 10 days in spring leafing and autumn was about four days earlier. It's Friday the 6th of August and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weather Snap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Despite a lull in the hurricane season this past few weeks, forecasts indicate things may change across the tropical North Atlantic, while in other parts of the Northern Hemisphere, cyclone activity has been lively. Here with an update, tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming. We had a very early start to the uh, Atlantic hurricane season. In fact, we had five tropical storms very quickly, and the latest of those was Hurricane Elsa. But since then, in the last uh, four weeks, we've had nothing in the Atlantic at all. And the conditions haven't been quite right in the deep tropics in the Atlantic for the formation of tropical storms. But in fact, the easterly waves, which are the disturbances which roll off the coast of Africa into the Atlantic, have still been there, but they've travelled all the way across to the eastern Pacific. And in fact, we've seen five tropical storms in the eastern Pacific in the last few weeks, although those have all kept out at sea, so have had no impact on land. Coming back to the Atlantic hurricane season, there are indications from the computer models that uh, we may well get one or even two tropical storms developed. So it looks like after a a month of fairly uh, quiet activity, we could see some uh, more storms develop in the Atlantic in the next week or so. Finally, if we go across to the other side of the Pacific Ocean into the Western Pacific, all eyes are on the uh, Olympics in Tokyo at the moment. And in fact, in the Western Pacific, the weather has been very disturbed in the last week or so, and we currently have three named storms in that area, one of which, Lupit, is affecting China at the moment. But uh, we're watching closely uh, Tropical Storm Mirinai because that is forecast to track northeastwards towards Japan over the next couple of days. Uh, It's not clear whether it will become a typhoon or not, but the current timing suggests that it will pass very close to Tokyo uh, over the weekend and particularly on Sunday, which is the time of the Olympic closing ceremony. Tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming. In other global weather news, this past week, extreme heat has swept across southeastern Europe, with temperatures reaching unbearable levels, peaking in the mid-40s, and threatening to topple the European record of 48 degrees Celsius set in Greece in 1977. A heat dome across Turkey and Greece has allowed heat to build day and night, with temperatures reaching 10 to 15 degrees above average. As a result, dangerous wildfires have intensified, pumping choking smoke into the air whilst producing strong, scorching winds. There is also a fear that the onset of thunderstorms could trigger further fires. A weak cold front from the northwest will allow temperatures to fall somewhat into the weekend. This movement of slightly fresher air is likely to stall and return north early next week. There's just a month left of meteorological summer, So what has been the general pattern of weather here in the UK so far this year? Earlier, I spoke to Mike Kendon from the Met Office National Climate Information Centre. We saw a fairly mixed weather pattern in June, as we often do. Overall, the month was warmer than average, 1.2 degrees above 1981-2010 long-term average. Quite dry in the north, um, but very wet across the southeast with um, some flash flooding. Overall for the UK, we had 59% of average rainfall and quite a sunny month, um, 107% of average for the UK overall, but quite sunny in the north. So the the high rainfall totals across the southeast were the, the thunderstorms that really blighted that region for a time. That's right. We've had quite a lot of thundery weather with some flash flooding, you know, heavy downpours in June. And that's also extended into July as well. Um, which has also been very wet across parts of the southeast, um, with some quite severe flash flooding at times, in particular in London um, on the 12th of July and also 25th of July. In terms of the amount of rainfall they saw in 24 hours, has that been unprecedented before? We do see flash flooding most years in the summer, of course, when you get the um, heat and energy in the atmosphere, you get thunderstorms and uh, often you get very high rainfall totals in short space of time. And of course, with 
the rain gauge network, it's quite hard to capture these events because they can be very, very localised. Let's talk about temperatures in July because we saw that heat wave which really spiked across many parts of the country and some record breaking temperatures in Northern Ireland. For most of the country, um, it wasn't a particularly unusual spell for the time of year. Um, temperatures into you know 30 degrees are not especially unusual. But for Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland obviously climatologically tends to be a cooler part of the UK. Um, and in fact, we reached 31 degrees in Northern Ireland for the first time on record. So there was a new record set of 31.3 Celsius at Castle Derg in County Tyrone on the 21st. So that's a new all time record. Looking at July overall, obviously that heat wave contributed to a warm month overall and it's come out as the fifth warmest July on record for the UK in a series back to 1884. Finally, let's talk about the State of the Climate Report 2020, which was published last month. Any surprises? Well, the report is telling us that climate change is happening now. We can see that clearly in our observations. And I think for many people, they think climate change is perhaps something that might affect them in the middle of this century or more of the impacts from it will be felt towards the end of the century. But the observations as presented in State of UK Climate Report show that our climate is changing now and Uh, within the data. Personally, I find these data, when I look at them, quite alarming. While in that conversation with Mike Kendham, we touched on the State of the UK Climate in 2020 report. This is an annual paper that summarises trends in UK weather based on diverse historical data, including temperature, sunshine and sea level. Last year, an additional section was included covering seasonal tree leaf growth. This forms part of a discipline known as phenology. Tim Sparks is a phenologist with the Woodland Trust and their Nature's Calendar Initiative. Here, he describes some of the changes that have recently been observed in UK wildlife. The most marked change over recent decades has been the advance in spring. So there's very strong evidence that a very wide range of events have become earlier. So we can see that evidence, for example, in earlier flowering of plants. We can see that in earlier activity of amphibians. We can see that in earlier flight dates of many butterfly species. The latest State of the Climate report for the UK states that the year 2020 was the third warmest, the fifth wettest and the eighth sunniest for the UK. And no other year has fallen into the top 10 on all three variables. Last year, did you see any particular deviations from the norm? In the State of the Climate report, we include information on four tree species. So we have the first leafing and the bare dates of Uh, elder, hawthorn, silver birch and oak. And for two of those, for elder and oak, they are the earliest spring leafing that we have recorded in over 20 years now of recording. Does that mean that spring finishes earlier for them as well as it started earlier? Or is it just extended? The growing season has extended. There is a tendency for autumn to follow spring. So if we tend to have early springs, we tend to have early autumns and vice versa, but it's not a thoroughly rigid rule. So here we've had an advance of something like uh, 10 days in spring leafing. So 2020 was 10 days earlier for spring and autumn was about four days earlier. Uh, So the consequence of that is about a six day longer period when the trees had leaves on them. And obviously other parts of the ecosystem within woodlands have to respond to that, don't they? Certainly. So many leaf eating insects need to time their emergence to match those of the leaves. So there's many caterpillar species, for example, that need to feed on those leaves when they're particularly young, fresh and palatable. And then as a consequence of that, there are many bird species that then need to feed on those caterpillars. So this food chain, the timing of that is quite important and they do all derive from when trees come into leaf. So you set up Nature's Calendar, which is an initiative by the Woodland Trust, and this has been running. I know it has because I've been using your data for many years now, but over a number of decades. And it's down to the general public, isn't it? 
Yes, that's right. I mean, this is a, a truly citizen science scheme. Uh, all of uh, the recorders do so voluntarily. We've been now going since 1998. The Woodland Trust has been very, very heavily involved since the year 2000. And we have some historic data that we can back that up with. So we have some you know, very long term records. The phenology section in uh, Space the Climate is smaller than the other sections, say sunshine, snow, wind. What other parameters would you like to see within the report? There is so much more that could be included here, and particularly with every passing year, we are accumulating more data. So I would like to see some data, for example, on the first appearance of insects, because many of those are very obvious in spring. Um, we also include, and for obvious reasons really, when people first cut and last cut their grass. And whilst it may appear peculiar, that first cutting and last lawn cutting, I think, can provide some really valuable information on the actual length of the growing season that that individual experiences. Tim Sparks, thank you very much. And more details of the State of the UK Climate in 2020 report can be found on our website, metoffice.gov.uk. Now with the weather outlook for the next few days, here's Ada McGiven. Low pressure will remain anchored across northern parts of the UK this weekend, providing a focus for further heavy showers and even some longer spells of rain. Those showers will be slow moving across western Scotland, northwest England and Northern Ireland in particular throughout Saturday. There's the risk of thundery downpours and some of the more intense showers will give 30 millimetres in an hour and more than 60 millimetres through the course of the day. With those kinds of rainfall amounts, there's the risk of disruption tricky driving additions, as well as localised flooding. Now, further south on Saturday, there'll be a bit more of a breeze. That means showers will move through more quickly. And there's a chance of some brighter skies at times, even some sunny spells, but it will feel cool in that breeze. North East Scotland sees a better day on Saturday compared to Friday, with a good chance of long spells of sunshine and largely avoiding the worst of the showers. On Sunday, many places will continue to see heavy showers circulating around that low pressure, which is only slowly filling across northern parts of the UK. And that means there will be further showers, especially in the north, where once again they'll be slow moving and there is that risk of disruption. But further south, I think, as that low pressure ever so slightly fills, it looks less showery. There'll be a better chance of some sunny spells in places, but Again, always the chance of a downpour, still a keen breeze and still feeling cool. The new week starts with that low pressure still close to the UK, providing further showers at times on Monday. But most places will turn dry out by Tuesday with some decent spells of sunshine. Thanks, Aidan. Just before we go, here's Stephen Dixon with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning Monday 26th of July. The highest daily temperature was Wellsbourne in Warwickshire, reaching 27.3 Celsius on Monday the 26th. And on the same day, during the early hours, Shap in Cumbria recorded the lowest minima of the week with 5.9 Celsius. Aldergrove in County Antrim had the wettest 24 hours. This was on Wednesday the 28th of July when 50 millimetres was recorded. And Dundrennan in Dumfries had the sunniest day on Monday with 11.1 .1 hours of sunshine. Thank you, Stephen. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.